All right. Mic check, check, I'm good. So I'm Max Duran, Max, Max Duran, CWB Association Welding Podcast, Pod, Pod, Podcast. Today we have a really cool guest, Welding Podcast. The show is about to begin. Hello and welcome to another edition of the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max Saron and we're here for another fantastic episode. We have Putty Wheatley, also Mina, just wanted to make sure because there's a couple names there with us today from Hypertherm. And Putty, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, thanks Max. Uh, all good down here. So first of all, is Putty short for something or is it a nickname or where to come from? Because I mean, I would love to hear the story on that. No, it's my nickname. Um, it's been with me all my life, and all my family and friends have always called me um, by that put or putty. Um, allegedly, I was uh, fat when I was a baby, uh, fat, <laughs> fat like a pudding. So the name stuck. <laughs> and um, so it's, it's like putty of, for pudding. Yeah, oh. yeah, or put. So yeah, the name stuck. So all my family, friends, uh, my children all call me by that. Um, so it's only really kind of in work I was ever, you know, previously known as John before I transitioned. And, you know, kind of when I transitioned, it was thinking about names and, you know, me to come along more recently. But all the people that I care about are always just going to call me Pud or Puddy anyway. So it didn't seem much point. Well, you know, and it's a fairly androgynous term, Puddy. Yeah. Like there's no there's no sense of uh, gender denomination to to pudding pudding so yeah no, well that's, that's what we thought so no oh, it worked out good then that's awesome yeah. and your accent where where are you from where's your stomping grounds um i'm from england originally um born and born and bred over in england and like i said um hypertherm moved me over to new hampshire in 2010 uh, for a position over here so you worked for hypertherm in england yeah, um, I was based in England, but I kind of covered Europe. Um, I worked for Hypertherm for 10 years over there from 2000 to 2010. And then, let's say, about 12 years ago, I come over here. So what's what was your background as a small child? You know, like what what were you what were your interests or, you know, roads that led you towards Hypertherm? Because Hypertherm is, a, is, a, is well, and I would even say in, two, in the year 2000, Hypertherm was a very niche company there was only a couple product lines that they really pushed hard back yeah. then you know how did you end up on their doorstep um well i come originally when i left school i went into welding so i was a welder originally for a number of years and um where i lived sort of on, on the southeast side of england um, industry wasn't um as great as it could have been and a lot of the companies you know kind of shut down and everything so welding wasn't a kind of a safe job to be in so i kind of come out of that and pursued a career in sales and then i worked for a swedish company um selling welding consumables okay which company are you not allowed to say or <laughs> no it's uh it's it was elga based in sweden i'm not sure okay. who they are now but um i worked for them um and one of the colleagues there left for hypertherm um a few years later um i changed jobs and i kind of could because sort of like it was consumables i moved over to hypertherm selling consumables uh, plasma consumables and um yeah sort of kind of started for there and yeah i was, seemed like i was pretty good at what i'd done so i've been in sort of like one way or the other i've always been in the consumable side at hypertherm Sort of traveling around supporting other people supporting our customers um and all things like that and then about four years ago i actually sort of kind of joined the uh, water jet division over in minnesota so i'm on the water jet side now but still on the consumable side for them and and water jets use many consumables so yeah kind of makes sense yep <laughs> i mean aside from the shot and all the stuff that's in there there's there's uh there's lots of pieces to a to a water jet setup and well yeah. and, and hypertherm is known for their for their precision and types of machines and their innovation as well exactly so yeah i mean it's so it's good it was a good sort of match and a good fix um you know i could pull on all the experience i've sort of you know built up 
you know, within Hyperderm and previous. So um, I led the sales team, the inside sales team over in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, it's been good. It's, it's good. It, you know, it keeps me busy. It's an area what I'm passionate about. The company's passionate about is consumable business. So it, it, it's good. it keeps me happy. Now, if we go back to your welding career in the south of England, you know, what was the type of work that normally is in that area? What's the industry for that area of the country? Um, where I was, cause it's actually sort of like Suffolk, Norfolk. It's it's sort of like big agricultural, um, kind of a, a lot of that. There was um, at the round time I was growing up, there's also a lot of um, insurance companies moved into the area. So it's, so it's a little mixed and varied, but there was one or two kind of um, fairly heavy engineering companies. Um, Ransom Sims and Jeffries was around at that time. Um, Ransom's rapiers. I think they made uh, they made one of the walking drag lines, um, crane fluid systems that made valves. So there's quite a few companies around, um, few structural steel companies. But like I said, over the years, um, you know, the industry sort of pulled away um, mm -hmm. from that from that area. I ended up I sort of started my career welding in structural steel, and then worked for a sort of uh, ended up working for a general fabricator. So. Yeah, it was good. I enjoyed it. And I kind of, you know, I enjoyed the industry, which was made me happy years later when I actually sort of joined Hypertherm because, mm. you know, sort of being in the engineer and fabrication business is, you know, I like that industry. It's good, you know, sort of, you know, being able to make and create things almost from nothing. You know, um, the only thing that really difference is, you know, instead of joining it up, I cut it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, for everything that gets welded, it probably got cut somewhere. So. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> You know, and, and it's interesting because this is a connection that happens often on the on the podcast, and it's the connection about um, starting in welding, but then transitioning to another job that is kind of on the periphery of welding. Yeah. You know, and, and and you know, sometimes that connection is not obvious. I think the sales connection is a little bit more obvious because you know. Even as a welder, you see the salespeople come in, they're talking to you, they got to know the language, they got to know the lingo, they got to know kind of what they're talking about. And you kind of, you can tell very quickly if a salesperson in the welding shop doesn't know what they're talking about, right? Like it's, uh, it's very easy to figure the fakers out. And so many of the most successful salespeople that I've met over my career in the steel trades we're at some point either a welder or an engineer or a fabricator or something else. Yeah. How much do you think your welding background has, you know, supported or helped you in your sales career? I think a great deal um, mm -hmm. because it kind of, you, you know, um, in the industries we work in, a lot of people are, you know, they're, they're cutting up parts to be welded up. Um, so even though I was a welder a long time ago, you you, you kind of know what you want. You know, and how the part, you know, and how the parts should match up, you know, and when you're fitting something up to weld it up, you know how you kind of, you know, the issues you're going to have if there's bad fit up and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So kind of being able to relate to that side, you can sort of look at downstream issues, you know, with cut quality, you know, and, and things like that, you know, you know what's going to be happening further down the line, you know, so if they can, you know, the better they can get it coming off the table, then, you know, the the better production is going to be, the easier production is going to be later on because you can sort of, you know, see some of those issues coming up. Yeah, and the dreaded rework. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> nobody <laughs> likes to be a part of that. And, if, you know, usually if something gets done wrong or cut wrong or welded wrong or something was wrong, that's yeah. when you really see bosses get heated up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, yeah, so I think, you know, kind of, you know, that that side of, you know, my early career, I think definitely sort of kind of helped and also you know being around in you know kind of shops and stuff where you know the loud noise you know often dusty smelly you got bright lights you know being being able to relate to that whole industry you know kind of helps when you know like say when you're talking to people uh, you know about what they're doing and how they're doing it you know it, it's you know they, rather than just being like yeah oh no here's another salesperson or whatever coming in <laughs> you know if you can relate a lot more to what they're doing, how they're doing it, and some of the issues they're having, it makes you a lot more credible. So when you first got into working specifically with with hypertherm, you know, back in, in 2000, yep. 
What was the product line back then? Like, how big of a company was it? Like, I, I'm not even sure where the where where did Hypertherm start? What, what's the inception point? New Hampshire. Um, yeah, that was that where it, headquarters is. Yeah. yeah, we we yeah we we passed out like 50 years a few years ago. So it, it it's it's mm -hmm. getting on now. But I think even when I joined in 2000, it it was sort of kind of you know um, leading the plasma industry. You know, and it's yeah. you know it's like one one of the um, you know the well, it was the top brand for plasma out there. I think, you know, probably mm -hmm. both manual and mechanized plasma. So, you know, it was well recognized, you know, um, you know, and and people were asking for that brand of plasma. Obviously, the range wasn't quite as extensive as it is now because it's grown over the years, you know, and the technology's changed a lot. I mean, there's been some great developments in the technology and the cut quality and, you know, the uh, consumables and the life and stuff. Um, but it was still a good brand back then, well recognized, you know, and uh, so kind of, I'd say almost doors would open just because of, because the, of the name, you because know. of the name. And, you know, like I, I've been in the industry for a long time and since the early 90s and and Hypertherm is a, a, like it's almost like a Kleenex, you know, yeah. it's like just the name, whether you're you, you may not even say let's go to the plasma cutter you'll just say let's go to the hypertherm and then you exactly. get there it's not even a hypertherm you know it's just like it's just the the name that you're used to hearing when it comes to plasma cutting and and obviously over time i think that that market has gotten more saturated there's a lot more players that are involved now um but as a young person working in a fabrication shop i remember the plasma was always like the the space aged machine you know because welding and oxy fuel cutting and saw work and you know the other abrasive cutters they all kind of had this feel of antiquity to them like this is the way it's been done for so long you can cut with a flame or you can cut with a grinder and even though plasmas have been around for you know half a century now um they still always have a feel of like this is a more advanced tool you know yep i agree with that you know and the technology all around it has grown you know in the um you know the software that runs the plasma you know the motion um you know how it nests and lays product out you know there's been a lot of development work in that you know as well as the actual plasma systems themselves to sort of cut faster and you know and give a higher quality cut you know i saw an invention from hyperthermo a few years ago maybe now two or three years ago that i still can't wrap my head around <laughs> and it's the one where the plasma can it's for uh, like cleaning off plate that it has things. So it's actually a bent plasma nozzle. It'll cut at a 90 degree angle. Or... Oh yeah. Yeah. Flush cut. Or, yeah. On the, yes. On, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So how, welds how? And... how do you redirect plasma? I don't understand. No, I'll leave that one to the engineers. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it in a magazine and I remember I reached out to my local hypertherm rep and I said, and this was right when it came out. I said, when soon as you got one of these in stock, you got to bring it by me and show me how it works because I'm not grasping the the science behind this. But you know that that is an amazing thing that's constantly happening in all the welding yeah. processes. Is that there's just these amazing new inventions. Yeah. Now, now for you, you know, starting in 2000 to 2010, let's talk about that first chunk of your career. What was your first kind of role within Hypertherm? Um. My my role, my first role um, back then, I worked out of my home when I was selling consumables. We also had a um, a brand of consumables, Centricut, which was for all other plasma systems, non hypertherm. Mm -hmm. um, and I was selling, I was said responsible for selling those consumables um, in all of the UK and Ireland. And after a couple of years, I got um, quite a lump of Europe. And I think um, by the time that all got integrated into hypertherm Europe. I think I was selling into about 15 countries um, in Europe um, from like my home office, you know, we were sending out the product and everything. So um, it kind of gave me a good grounding because obviously being in England, you know, we were what, um, five hours ahead of the office over here. Mm -hmm. So all, you know, any sort of technical support, customer support and all that to the customers all had to come from me. So as well as, you know, a kind of a sales job, um, it was also, you know, sort of kind of helping people out technically, um, visiting customers, demonstrating product, you know, um, all of that. Um, and that, that's kind of, yeah, I mean, that, that was good fun, you know, uh, 
back then, mm-hmm. even as it is now. But that's sort of kind of what I started off doing. I think that was for about the first five years when it all got integrated um, into Hypertherm Europe and the role changed. And I become, um, I sort of took on um, supporting the Hypertherm consumable products, uh, mainly for the mechanized systems. Um, and I was sort of traveling around Western, Southern Europe and the Middle East, you know, supporting end user customers and our distribution network, you know, um, sort of kind of demonstrating product, helping them sell the product, because obviously there was um, a lot of aftermarket companies trying to get a slice of the hypertherm consumables. So it's, mm-hmm. you know, sort of going around proving our technology and where the value is in our products, you know, and, you know, the support we could give. So, yeah, you know, I, I've always noticed that even the, the copper color of hypertherm parts are a different color than other companies you can you can almost visually tell yeah. which ones are hyperthermic and which ones aren't and i always thought that was interesting they must have some secret recipe well you know we you know the, where the parts are manufactured here in new hampshire i mean they take a lot of care and quality you know people expect that you know um <clears throat> achieving you know high consistency in parts you know is difficult you know but all the processes they have um, in manufacturing the parts, you know, are followed closely by everyone to make sure there's great repeatability and, you know, the next part works as great as the last, you know, and that that's, you know, that's what I think one of the reasons why people buy hypertherm, yeah, they can rely on the product, you know, and it does what it says, you know, it, they, mm-hmm. they put it in, they know they're going to get good quality cuts, good life, you know, good support. So, One of the things that I noticed that hypertherm does as a comp- company, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I may be way off, but they don't seem to overextend themselves into other products. They they develop things, especially with automation and robotics. Yeah. So definitely, that's a very obvious fit that Hypertherm jumped on and, and has been running with. But you, I haven't seen Hypertherm get into welding machines or arc machines or you know other plasma related machines. Like I mean, there's plasma welding that is very popular out there. And and to my knowledge, I don't know if Hypertherm offers many plasma arc welding solutions, but I feel like Hypertherm has kind of found their niche and kind of stuck in it and tried to be the best at that. And and am I wrong or or has Hypertherm oh, done think, other uh, stuff? You know? I think that's a good observation. I mean, you know, um, Plasma was, you know, their leading product um, and probably, you know, and still is in most ways. I mean, they have branched out into other areas. I mean, they have the mechanized plasma, the manual plasma systems, yeah, the hand for handheld cutting. Um, they also produce laser consumables. Um, for the laser industry and um, in the last what, seven eight years they've gone into water jet you know but it's it, but it's all still sort of kind of severing materials rather than joining mm-hmm. so yeah we've we've stayed pretty much in the niche area of cutting but the technologies of how the materials are cut you know they have branched out a little bit in. yeah now after you were working with you know you said you had 15 countries in in yep. total how much of, and this is just a personal question because I've, I've worked in West Africa a few times on projects. Did you have any work to do in Northern Africa? Because I've noticed that many of the European sales reps kind of bleed into the the Northern continent of Africa. I never went down into uh, any any of the um, Africa region at all, but um, a lot of my time I spent in the Middle East. Um, mm, right. I spent quite, quite a bit of time over in the Middle East. Yeah, um, Italy was another big area, Germany. Um, you know, I'd, I'd spend a lot of time in sort of one area, sort of building up the business and then, you know, kind of seems to be establishing it and, um, you know, on the consumables and then sort of like maybe move on a little bit. I mm. mean, um, Northern Ireland, you know, that, you know, um, little place off the coast, you know, uh, the amount of industry over there was like phenomenal for the, for the, for the area. Size, yeah. 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 You know, and I spent a lot of time over there. So it's really, I'd, you know, I'd go where I was needed. I mean, I was, you know, China, I spent a fair bit of time in too. You know, Australia, I visited a few times. So go around to quite a few places supporting, you know, our sales teams and our customers, you know. Uh, that needed. sounds super interesting. Sounds like a dream job. Oh, it's good. Well, I enjoyed it, you know. Uh, <laughs> never wanted to go on an aeroplane for, for personal holidays. But, you know, other, other than that, it was good. <laughs> 
So then, you know, you're, you're working away, you're establishing yourself in, in, it sounds like you're the, you're like you were preparing for COVID in 2000, you know, working from your home <laughs> office, like you, you knew something was coming 20 years before everybody else and you're getting ready, but you're working away and you're kind of climbing your corporate ladder, you know, you're getting a larger portfolio. And then as you get closer to this 10 years before they ship you over, you know, why, what, what was the motivation to move you up and out or did you know what well, did something change in how hyperthorn was managing the european sales market or was it you moving up and out to another department um i think it was me moving up and out i what you know um i think by the um by yeah by the end of my you know 10 years um that's sort of kind of support you know supporting quite a few people a lot of sort of um, other people would come on into a similar role um, which I'd help sort of, you know, um, sort of train them and go through them. Um, and a position came up over here, you know, um, in the United States, the head office would like to become a leader of a team, like a product specialist um, mm -hmm. leader, you know, which um, specialized in sort of, you know, in plasma consumables. And it still had a very sort of sales flavor to it, but it was sort of like more of a supporting role. Um, where I'd have a team and become a leader, you know, and also kind of um, it opened up new areas for me to travel into and, you know, places to mm -hmm. go and places to visit. You know, I was, um, once I sort of moved over here, I was traveling around um, in North America a fair bit. And that's when I sort of started to travel to China more, you know, and other and sort of other areas, you know, which, you know, weren't in, you know, obviously in the European region at all. So mm -hmm. there was there was a sort of you know a lot of attractiveness to that, and obviously being over here at the the corporate head office, you know that that could lead on to potential other opportunities as well. So uh, should we be maybe putting the pitch in now for you know future CEO for Putty Wheatley at the uh, Hypertherm? Uh, I I think yeah that would be uh, yeah that would be nice, but there, there's a uh, but I enjoy what I do, so I don't think I'll ever be going to those heady heights. <laughs> You never know. You never know. And you, you never know. I I would have never thought I'm where I am with my job, honestly. And sometimes you just kind of work hard and things just kind of line up, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, when you came over to this team in in the U.S., um, you know, did you have a family? Were you uprooting everybody or were you on your own? Or, uh, or you uproot, know, uprooting everyone, uh, wife and three children. Yeah. And how did that go? Um, not too bad, you know. It was um, <laughs> kind of a loaded question because it's not yeah. going to be easy. <laughs> no, it was difficult. It was difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, in honesty, we were thinking of leaving the UK anyway. Um, but we were okay. kind of, we were possibly going to be destined for France, mm -hmm. um, and then the position come up over here. So we just sort of sold, you know, all the rest of the family that we were going, you know, just across a little river, you know, into France, you know, <laughs> as, as opposed to coming across, you know, the, was it the Atlantic? The over, big river. You know, yeah, the, all the way over to uh, North America. So I think it was kind of hard on a lot of other people, but um, I mean, we were fairly tight and close as a family. Um, my three children, the oldest was 11, and he would have been changing schools in the UK. Right. So we, if he had changed schools, it would have been really difficult for us to, um, yeah, it was kind, kind of a nice transition there. mark for him. Yeah, know? so it's so it's a, you know so it's a a good sort of transition point to get everyone over here, and um, yeah, I mean it's it, you know I'm, it was tough in places for sure. Um, you know, you 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 have a network around you wherever you grow up and you've lived, you know, um, and then moving over here, we didn't know anything about anything or anyone, you know, so. Mm -hmm silly things you want to do you know like decorating you know find an electrician doctors anything yeah. all, all all that suddenly becomes hard work and difficult you know because you, you just don't know how the system works and you, you even know. the meals that you used to like to prepare that were so easy yeah the spices aren't available or something's not yeah. available or... yeah but it you know so some of those things were difficult but then on the other side you know there's there's a whole a whole bunch of new things yeah, yeah to explore you know there was new foods new places to go you know and all that so you know we kept getting asked and still do occasionally do we miss england you know yeah you know of course it's our home you know kind of realistically mm. that way it's where we grew up but we're not going back i mean we're, we're rooted over here now 
and um, you know, there's still a lot to discover. So yeah, we we like it. So it's well, who knows? Maybe this isn't the final stop in the <sighs> Wheatley uh, family journey. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got lots of work up in Canada. It's yeah, up here. <laughs> Well, you know, this is a great time for us to take our quick commercial break, you know, right to where you just landed on this side of the pond, you're, you're getting set up and you're starting your, 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 your run here at the, at headquarters at Hypertherm. Yep. So, you know, we'll come back after a quick, you know, uh, one minute break with our sponsors and we'll continue here with Putty Wheatley on the CWB Association podcast. And we're back here on the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max Saron. Thanks for staying with us during the show. Interesting story from Putty Wheatley from Hypertherm about starting in the UK, born and bred in England, and then making his way over here with his family uh, to to the to the United States. Well, I shouldn't say here because I'm in Canada, so that's uh, not quite the same thing. But um, what was the culture shock like for you? Like, I mean, I think people tend to think that it's easier coming to North America than it is. If you're English speaking, um, you know, you know, people are gonna say, Oh, you're English. You speak the language already. No problem. The, you know, was there any issue? Like what were some of the obstacles you felt coming over? Lots. Uh, I mean, we, <laughs> we, 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 we do, we, yeah, you know, allegedly both, both, uh, you know, countries speak English, but it's very different. Oh yeah. You know, um, and even now, you know, it, kind of still get misunderstood sometimes you know um, mm -hmm. things we ask yeah people just don't understand sometimes it, it's <laughs> yeah but equally it happens back the other way as well you know so um but you know getting the children set up in school was difficult and then you know kind of getting into a new education sort of system and sort mm -hmm. of settling in making new friends um and just you know finding you know finding our way around everyday life you know like i said before you know kind of um you know the medical and doctors seeing you know seeing people over here it's very different in america to what it is back in england i mean yeah we have the yeah, national health have... service where yeah. it's all free yeah you know over here it's not you know so uh um you know navigating things like that were difficult i mean when we first come over just going to the shops for groceries i mean you know it take hours you know, because, you know, because you wouldn't, you know, all the brands are different. Everything's different, you know. And What is this? What is this? Yeah. Yeah. So trying to find something similar to what you had. Yeah. And there, there, mm. there was mistakes, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> But, it, yeah, it just sort of kind of took time, you know, to sort of settle in and, you know, kind of life over here, you know, was, you know, being different. I mean, we, we accepted it would be different, you know, and then winter hit. You know, yeah, uh, and you know, <laughs> yeah. Wow, I mean, where we were in in England, I mean, if it got down to freezing, we would say that was cold. You know, and it, yeah. you know, if we got a, you know an inch of snow for half a day, you know, that was it. You know, everyone's so, on the toboggans. <laughs> no, everyone was stuck indoors. No one would go out. You know, <laughs> so it's a uh, yeah. You know, kind of going through that first winter was tough because you know to say we. Well, were, New Hampshire is known for the snowfall too. Yeah, we were woefully. I'm prepared for that. I'm telling you. So, <laughs> although I must say, you guys don't get as cold as where I am in Canada, but I do know you guys get lots of snow there. Uh, once it gets, you know, once it gets to like, you know, ten, fifteen below, who's counted anymore? <laughs> yeah. Well, once you're under ten minutes to dead in the open air, then it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> no, exactly. Hat and scarf weather. And how was the how was the transition to the new job? You know, how did it how did it feel? rolling into a new setting, new country, but now you have this amazing new opportunity to be a leader for a group of people. You have a, quite a bit of experience with the product and, and with, the, with yeah. what you're, what you're supporting, you know, what was that new role like? Um, it was kind of a little strange at first, a little sort of daunting because I know a lot of the people, um, anyway, o over here and, um, some of the people on my team I'd knew previously. So, so kind of having worked having them sort of once upon a time coming over to help support me and now becoming their leader was it's a little bit of a strange dynamic mm -hmm. um you know but then also kind of put on top of that you know in a different country and i'd say there are a lot of similarities but you know how we interact and what we say and how we say it you know is mm -hmm. it can be different so kind of you know learning what was 
acceptable. Let's say what's acceptable yeah. and not acceptable. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of maybe a little mm -hmm. harsh, but, you know, just how you phrase things and word things up, so, you know, it took a little bit of time, you know, and, um, but no, it, it, it was a good challenge. And, you know, we kind of had, you know, we had some good ideas, you know, the team were involved and, you know, we, we kind of, you know, made our way forward and, you know, we, we'd done some good stuff and planned some good things and, you know, we still traveled, you know, kind of around, it was like around the world supporting, you know, customers and um, uh, other salespeople and, you know, our distribution network as well. So th that, that was, that sort of didn't really change too much, but sort of, you know, having a responsibility for other people to go and do that, you know, was a little, a little different, you know, and, um, you know, different people have different comfort levels going into different countries, you That's know, right. uh, you know, so although I always said, you know, I can't guarantee you, you know, that you're, you're never going to go somewhere you don't like, you know, between us all, we see if we can work it out, you know, cause, mm -hmm. you know exactly. That, so, so it all went, you know, it all went well and we, you know, um, I, I'd like to think we've done a lot of good, you know, um, we help, helped and support a lot of people with, with the products. So, you know, and I remember years ago before I got my first international gig working, um, actually my, my first major international gig was in Ghana in Africa. And someone asked me when I got back, you know, how did you get that gig? And I said, uh, because of someone's finicky stomach. And sometimes it could just be that. Um, the, the the normal person that normally did the international gigs um, had had a bad experience in West Africa with the food and would refuse to go back because they just got very violently ill the previous time and would, didn't want to work there. So, you know, the, the opening came up for this, you know, short-term gig in overseas. And uh, it said, you know, hopefully somebody with a strong stomach. And so I thought, that's me. That helps. It can help. <laughs> yeah, so, and uh, I'm not a picky eater. I'm from South America myself. And, you know, I found, I joke with people that sometimes the hardest food I ever had to learn to eat was North American. Um, you know, the food in South America is very easy and tangible. Like for me, I'm obviously biased, but I find the food here very salty and heavy and, and, and conducive to heart and stomach problems <laughs> but you know i went to africa and i loved the food it was fantastic and i really like i mean as when you're traveling internationally and you're especially in charge of a team of international travelers there's a lot of small nuances that need to be taken into account yeah i agree you know um a lot of the trips were like kind of two week trips as well or maybe mm -hmm. occasionally longer i mean you know kind of my rule was, you know, if you're going to do something, do it on the first week, because on the second week, yeah, you're you, don't done. Want, you, you don't want any <laughs> stomach problems, you know, especially if you're on like a 13, 14 hour flight, you know, that's, uh, you know, <laughs> that's never fun. Yeah. So yeah, go take care of yourself the second week and, you know, but don't be too adventurous. Yeah. Lots of veggies on that second <laughs> yeah, week, get yeah, everything yeah. flushed out. <laughs> uh, so you came over as this lead position and then you said that, you know, over these last 12 years, you, you kind of moved into the more of the mechanized or, or automatic processes stuff. When did that happen? Well, it's all, yeah, I've always kind of been more involved on the mechanized side. Um, but I think when I came over here, it, it, the focus was more on mechanized, mechanized plasma. So, mm -hmm. so that was good. You know, we got into, you know, it's, you know, we was going into some, big companies and some big industries, you know, shipbuilding, um, you know, naval bases. Again, that that sometimes had to be sort of split between us because because um, I wasn't a citizen. I couldn't get into um, right, right. naval For naval security, yards over here. Yeah. yeah. But also vice versa. Um, you know, in 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 other countries, you know, um, there's sort of different rules and regulations everywhere. So there were sort of considerations to do. But yeah, kind of you know, having, having, having an interest in heavy industry, I think it, it is helpful, you know, um, because like I said, it was, it was as interesting for me to go into some of these places as I think it was for them to have me there. So, you know. And are you an American citizen now or are you PR? No, I'm, um, um, I'm still on, still on a green card at the moment. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it needs to be renewed soon. So I'll probably renew it again and then go for citizenship halfway through that. Uh, left it a bit late this time, I think. <laughs> but I mean, you you don't have to be right. You can. 
Unless your company's saying, hey, buddy, it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, yeah, that they seem happy with me and yeah, I think everything's good. So we will become citizens. Like I said, we're rooted here. Um, you know, we have grandchildren here now, so. That's nice. You know, I, I, I waited quite a bit. I turned to Canadian when I was 19. We came to Canada when I was a child. So there was, a you know, almost a 20 year spread there yeah. before we became Canadian. But it wasn't until I realized that I couldn't vote. And I was, I was very pumped to vote when I turned 18. And then I was yeah. like, well, I can't because I'm not a citizen. And I was like, dang it. And then I actually got my military service card for back home. You know, hey, you're 18. You can come down with a free plane ticket if you want to come do your military service. And I got scared. And I said, I don't want to do military service. And I don't, I want to stay in Canada. So I was like, I better, I better get this Canadian citizenship thing taken care of. Yeah, I can't believe it. You know, sort of, um, like I say, we didn't go on screen card straight away, you know, mm -hmm. when, we moved, when we moved here, but you know, the um, green cards last 10 years and I can't believe that's, you know, that's nearly whipped by as quick as it has. So yeah, it's, wow. it's kind of, it's kind of been a bit of a shock. So how was the, how was like your, your, your role now? What is it specifically today? Um, I'm in, I'm in the water jet side of the business now. Um, and I'm kind of on a sales marketing role. Look at, again, looking after the consumables um, and, you know, looking at ways we can improve our consumable sales, um, gain more consumable share. Uh, obviously, there's there's still an aftermarket side sort of chipping away, you know, trying to sort of gain our consumables. So um, looking at how we can, you know, improve, um, get a strong message out there about our consumables, why people should use original consumables on their water jet systems. Um, and now it's I'm kind of as well as looking at that in North America, I'm also looking at it in sort of the the European region as well. So it's sort of kind of uh, a little bit more global. Um, mm -hmm. But but again, it's it's still along a sort of similar lines of what I've always done. Um, but so now it, it's kind of a little bit more um, supporting rather than direct sales, I would say, because you know I'm sort of trying to come up with processes and ways. You know, for other people to use to ensure we get our um, share of the consumable business that you know we we believe we you know should have. Mm -hmm. And what's the biggest difference? Kind of an ambiguous question, but what's the biggest difference between selling water jet parts versus plasma parts? Um, are they kind of the same? There, there are a lot. There, there are there are a lot of similarities, um, mm -hmm. but there, there's the there's also sort of some differences because on on plasma the parts get used sort of quicker. Um, okay. It's on the water jet side that the parts, you know, because of the sort of the, the nature, they 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 sort of last longer. It would seem so. Yeah, it, it, that way it's sort of difficult to sort of draw a comparison, you know. Mm -hmm. And I would say. Um, there's the parts, there's more parts in the actual, um, in the pump, you know, where the high pressure water's made, which you would, which we sort of kind of sell parts, which is sort of consumable. Yeah, there's a lot of seals and, you know, kind of mm -hmm. parts like that in the water jet system. As on the plasma side, it was mainly sort of, you know, just at the cutting head and the torch where the action was, but sort of now there's other parts, you know, kind of of the system, you know, which are considered consumable. So um, that, that's a little bit different. And also the types of cutting, because um, obviously plasma, you, you know, you're just sort of cutting, you know, kind of um, metal products uh, yeah. with water jet. They cut, yeah. yeah, they're cutting, you know, anything, anything and everything. Yeah, you know, yeah. you could be talked to, you know, someone one day is cutting food, diapers you know next day you're talking <laughs> to someone who's cutting you know aerospace parts you know yeah uh, you know um so it, it's very very different that way now in terms of you know the um the type of equipment you know like when you look at water jets yeah you're you're looking at a much more complex setup you know it's not like you're just gonna go buy um a plasma machine and plug it into the wall and hook up an airline and now I'm cutting. Look at me, I'm amazing. And if I put it on a trolley or a, or a machine, it's basically just the same plasma, but with a with a with a you know a gantry that's going to direct it around. But when you go to water jet, you're looking at pumps, 
water line, water access, you know, power for the machines, tables, weight. Water jets have a, you know, a certain weight that, you know, that immediately is sometimes daunting for wherever your shop is. So as a sales person or as someone looking and pushing, you know, the, the product out, what are some of the, like the steps that you got to make sure you cover with your customers when you're looking to sell a water jet? Um, I think it's the application and what they're trying to achieve and what they want yeah. to do and how they want to do it. You know, um, I think they're some of the biggest things that, you know, uh, um, you know, again, that's, that's all kind of one of the differences between the two, because obviously, you know, plasma, you're only sort of kind of cutting conductive materials, you know, mm -hmm. and it cuts it, you know, very quickly. Um, with water jet, you can cut, you know, a whole a whole array of other materials um and although you know the cut speeds might be a little bit slower with water jet you know where you can make up a lot of time is like there's no secondary operations you know so you know the, the part you take out is kind of done yeah ready to go because it's clean you know mm -hmm. there's no heat affected zone you know there's there's very little sort of kind of um angle on the cut edge if if you know if any at all so and it's very clean. So, and also, you know, with the wide array, you know, kind of array of materials that can be cut, you know, people are not just restricted, you know, to cutting, you know, metal or ceramics or glass, you know, they, it kind of spreads out what they, what they want. So it's, you know, it's really what they're trying to achieve and what they want to do, you know, and, and how they want to do it. And that's super interesting for me because, you know, <clears throat> The technology for all these machinery is constantly just climbing yep. and climbing. You know, where do you see it going? You know, like what what's the, what's the next step with with this? You know, like oh, tabletop plasmas or tabletop water jet machines where I can you know well, just cut it, things it, in my living room or is that already well, out there? It, like <laughs> almost, yeah. I mean, there's yeah. you know there's um you know because Omax is part of the Hypertherm Group now. You mm -hmm. know, they have um the Proto Max, which is it's not quite tabletop but it, you know the footprint of it is fairly small you know we see that going into a lot of um, sort of colleges and you know places like that education areas where you know people can you know run you know a small sort of water jet system and it, it you know although it's small everything is the same as what you get on like you know a you know 20 by 10 table um, it works that, you know, everything's the same on that and it's a good introduction for people, but also sort of people, I wouldn't say a hobbyist because it's a bit more serious than that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people who, you know, maybe, you know, cutting things, you know, in their, in their own sort of small workshop, you know, they can have these, you know, one of these things fairly inexpensively and, and cut a whole array of materials, you know, so yeah, that's, you know, kind of water you know the water jet side you know on that that particular system has really opened it up to a lot of people um you know as well as you get into the more sort of you know the bigger industrial sort of larger systems you know where you know it, it can cut anything and obviously especially with some of the more specialized materials you know and you know wanting to eliminate a heat affected zone mm -hmm. you know you kind of um you then get limited to the technology of what you can use because you know um plasma laser you know, oxy fuel cutting, you're all going to get some portion of heat affected zone there. So if you want to do away with that, you're only really left with water jet. So yeah, like I know that some of the duplex materials are very sensitive to heat uh, yeah. for stainless. So you, you know, basically you're, you're limited to only water jet cutting. Yeah. You know, and the more specialized some of these materials are getting, you know, and, and people wanting to eliminate, you know, that, that, that zone, then, you know, it makes it a little bit more of an exciting time for water jet, I think. Yeah, I love I love both angles of that. You know, there's the small business side. I still have my small company that I've had forever, and it's basically just out of my garage. But I always look at my garage footprint and be like, you know, if I got one of these little machines, I could just do more. I could just do these little things more. And yeah, I'm not doing a run of a hundred because I can't drop a ten by ten sheet on there. But so what? You know, like I even like I mean, I'm just if you're just not that scope. And I think that that's a really interesting and exciting thing for small young business owners to be you know i can invest into smaller pieces of equipment and maybe i sacrifice a little bit on speed but i don't sacrifice on precision or quality yeah right yeah and then on the other side is the the just the amazingness 
of machinery. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, you're looking at uh, multi-access with like movable tables and jigs and positioners and and the speed and accuracy. And I would say, honestly, the ease of use has been one of the biggest advancements in the last few years. How yep. much easier it is to program them. Yep, I think that's a big thing, you know, um, how much easier they've become to use, um, you know, and how, you know, from print to part, you know, how quick and easier that's become, you know, mm -hmm. um, you don't have to sit down and, you know, do loads and loads and loads of programming or test cuts and, you know, dialing in the cut quality and stuff like that, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of that's been taken away. Well, and Hypertherm has a free online tutorials and videos and stuff like that too. Right, they have a whole bunch of yep. stuff online just to train on how to program their machines, and it's all free. Yep, yep. Uh, sort of big into the training side, you know, and self-help, you know, and especially, you know, I mean, even over here in North America, you know, all the different time zones you got, you know, if people have access to good training materials and they're able to help themselves, that's a big, you know, that's a big plus. I think um, you don't people don't always want to wait two, three, four hours you know uh, <laughs> you know to do something and if they can you know if they can like you know tap around on their phone for 10 minutes and find the help you know and um the stuff they need then that's that's a big thing awesome you know so you know I, i've been loving this conversation about hypertherm and the equipment and your career and i think it's fantastic but i do want to talk to you a little bit about something more personal and I hope this is okay, but I, you, you brought up that you were, you know, when you were going to go, you went through a transition yeah. and, you know, and you identify as trans. And I would love to ask you some questions about that because I feel, I feel like that's important in this community, in the welding community, in the steel trades community to have more open conversations about, you know, that aspect of society and just the reality of it. You yeah. know, at what point in your life did you, you know, realize that you were going to be or were trans or wanted to be a part of the trans community? Um, it goes back a long time. Mm -hmm. um, my earliest memories, I think probably when I was about five or six years old. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I kind of didn't really understand it or know what, you know, kind of what was it, but I kind of just knew you know um i was i was kind of meant to be more female than male um the fit but, felt better you know yeah but you know kind of at that age it probably wasn't until my teens uh, that i even had the language to describe right. what it was you know or how i felt so it's like quite a big gap you know um and so growing up in those times it you know you, there wasn't the information you know, you were, you, you know, you couldn't go and talk to people about it, you know, so just had to sort of kind of grow up and deal with it. Um, mm -hmm. And then obviously, you know, coming into the, you know, going through school, leaving school and going into work, obviously, I've, you know, like I said, I've, you know, been in the welding industry one way or the other, um, you know, the engineering sort of fabrication industry all my life. It's very and, male dominated, very yeah. macho. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it has changed a lot over the years for sure. But, you know, certainly back in the early days, it it was, you know, very much male dominated and it, it kind of still is now. So I never felt kind of safe mm -hmm. to be able to come out of that stage. I mean, you know, um, my wife has always known. I mean, we, we moved in together. I think it was about 19 when we moved in. So she's known from then. Yeah. You know, so but that was the only person that sort of ever really knew, you know, so, um, yeah, it's kind of kept tucked away in secret from the rest of the world, you know, mm -hmm. until I did come out. And, you know, you, you use the word language, and I feel like this is such a important place to start when it comes to any, any issue. If you can't communicate, you're stuck. Like, yeah. I mean, no matter what it is. And, and the language that we use, and when we discuss anything to do with the LGBT community, um, the trans community, you know, and what's, you know, that this whole giant demographic of society that has been forced to kind of live underground or, or hidden because feelings of safety, comfortableness or family, religion, whatever it is. Um, if there isn't a proper language for 
to have these conversations, then there's almost nowhere to start. Yep. Now, when you were young, you know, you said you, you didn't really have that language access to you. Do you feel, and this is me just thinking out loud, that in today's society that the, it would be, you know, that there's better access to understanding that language, say at an early age, at, you know, six or seven or 10 or 13, about what these differences are and what these, you know, um, type, you know, there's all these variations of the human being and they're, they're all okay. Like, do you feel like this is better now than say when you were a child or, or has progressed? I think it's a world apart, you know, from yeah. certainly when I was young, I mean, um, you know, when I came out, um, you know, it was not only to friends, work colleagues, you know, over here, but it was, you know, to all my family back home, you know, and all the colleagues I sort of kind of, you know, had worked with in the past. Um, and it was kind of shocking that, you know, some family members who got younger children, you know, sort of around eight, nine, ten, you know, probably had a better understanding <laughs> yeah. than the parents, you know, because, you know, they, they either knew people or, you know, they, they, they'd sort of kind of had some sort of inclusion and diversity, you know, kind of education at school, you know, maybe mm -hmm. not into a, a huge degree, but they kind of understood, you know, the differences and, you know, when they were sort of told, you know, puts transition in, they kind of understood what was going on and they understood all the language. I mean, that was, you mm -hmm. know, very missing. You know, I think, you know, when I was young and, you know, for quite a few years afterwards, only sort of really seems to have been in recent years where that sort of kind of opened up a lot more. And I think that whole side is, is a lot better. It's still a ways to go for sure, but it's a lot better. You know, like in my, in my personal life, I've had many people in my family and my friends, my relationships be part of the LGBTQ community. And I've been around that my whole life. My family yeah. didn't seem to care. I don't know, just some yeah. weirdness in my family where it was just like, whatever. And so I've been around it. And I remember, so here's a, just a, it doesn't, I don't even know if it's important, but I've been watching RuPaul's Drag Race since the first season. I love that show. Yeah. I've always loved that show. I love the competition. I love the art. I love theater. I love all that stuff, fashion, all that stuff. And for the first 10 seasons, the, you were not allowed to say the word trans on that show. It was, you know, non-trans. And then now, because of social pressure, and, and so even inside diversity groups, there's still, you know, yeah. divisions. Yeah. And the, these divisions you can look at wholesale as a society saying we suck at being inclusive, but then even within the groups, we can suck at being inclusive. <laughs> yeah. Like, so like I within the gay, yeah, yeah, and and even within the gay community, trans has always been kind of a a different angle, you know, yep. or a different conversation. So when when you speak of coming out, you know, this was you coming out as trans or you coming out as gay, leading towards trans, or you know, what was that process like for you? No, um, it was coming out as trans. It was it was worrying. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, my wife had not always known, um, but my children hadn't known, and no one had really a clue. I mean, I thought there was, you know, there were signs there along the way, but um, yeah, so no one suspected anything. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and as, as sort of my transition was progressing, I was sort of kind of getting more and more worried and stressed about it, you know, um, although sort of hypertherm, you know, was promoting in inclusion and diversity, and, you know, and, and had a good, a good program, mm -hmm. you know, about it. It still would have been that the, I didn't know of another trans person within hypertherm when I come out. Yeah. And sometimes you don't want to be the pioneer. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, <laughs> and obviously kind of knowing, you know, kind of quite a few people in, you know, in the trans community and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of how, how that news and can be kind of received and, you know, the thoughts of trans people. Um, you know, I, I was worried about my job. I was worried about, you know, are the children ever going to talk to me again? You know, am I going to have friends running a mile? You know, it it was all really, really worrying. Um, and the level of stress was did get too much, um, which is I can imagine. You know, what, one of the reasons why I did sort of eventually come out, and I did sort of find an ally within Hypertherm, um, who I started talking to about it, which really helped. You know, and and together we kind of you know made made a plan for coming out. You know, mm -hmm. but 
it's it was a huge huge step you know and I, everything i thought could go wrong was just running through my head the whole time <laughs> you know it was you know it was it was all bad i mean what do they call that catastrophizing oh, where everything God. is a catastrophe <laughs> and and the rest i mean it was kind of because obviously before i came out of work i did sort of come out to family and stuff first um which sort of kind of gave me some hope because you know the children my children were fantastic i mean obviously a lot older now but they were sort of more and there was not they were more they were unhappy that i hadn't said anything before yeah you like know, you've been and, hiding a secret from them yeah you know and they they had noticed differences because you know um my love, dress love. sense is, yeah. yeah you know my dress sense had become more androgynous you know mm-hmm. and even they sort of you know they were noticed not only the sort of the you know the change in style of clothes but also the change which was happening in me you know because of that i was becoming you know kind of more happy and you know the mm-hmm. weight was lifting so that was good you know um the lead up to me coming out with work yeah i can't believe you know i mean i, I i'd have days and nights in tears um yeah. I, I was a mess but kind of you know when we sat my leader down and we and we spoke with her you know and then it kind of you know radiated out from there you know the support was really good i mean i can't you know i can't imagine it being any better to be honest you know and it and it kind of made me wonder you know why did i wait that long yeah you know because even with all the stress and anxiety of the release you know the 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 coming out that's never gonna surpass the stress and anxiety of a lifetime of hiding that's daily 24 hours seven days a week 365 days a year since you were five of having this weight on you of not being able to just be yourself just that simple you know yeah that that was you know and it was also you know because i'd changed roles and i'd I'd moved over, I hadn't sort of fully moved over, but I was in Minnesota a lot of the time, yeah, which is a, um, yeah, it's certainly, yeah, it's a much larger sort of city and population than it is over here in New Hampshire. Um, and it kind of, it, it felt sort of kind of maybe a little more inclusive over there. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, New Hampshire is a fairly remote place, you know, wherever you go in New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. So sort of being over to go over to the, you know, the Twin Cities, you know, um, mix with other people, find, you know, kind of people aligned with me uh, and how I was, you know, was, was really helpful. And that, you know, that kind of started me off, you know, even, even sort of, you know, kind of, I think more with a purpose and, you know, with a vision that I was going to, you know, kind of come out to everyone yeah and there's a whole notion that the you know the cis male or the general population has access to the privilege of without even realizing it and that's just being able to go out and have drinks and be with people that you uh feel you're affiliated with and just enjoy the day just that simple context can be like, I mean, even amongst my my gay and lesbian friends, you know, the that there's I, I feel like there's probably more support in society for gay lesbian community now than ever, which is still not great by any means, but better than ever. And they have places where they can go where it's, you know, yeah. only for the gay lesbian community where they can sit and be comfortable. Um, and and that is such a small thing that can weigh so heavy. Yeah. Imagine the rest. Like just I mean, if you just look at all the other contexts of life, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it it you know it was, you know that was a big thing, you know for me, you know just sort of kind of being able to go out, you know more and more as the real me, mm-hmm. you know but but along that you know al- along with that brought kind of other stresses and strains as well because you know the the more life uh, I was leading as myself outside of work, there was also that that made more chance of, encounters of encounters and you know, discovery by others so so although one side i was you know i was kind of getting more happy with myself it was creating mm. more stresses and worries <laughs> on another side as well so, so yeah you're and you know quite, like never quite free sexual identity is not something that you wear on the front of your forehead you know what i mean like people have 
I, so I'm from another country. I'm an immigrant. I'm brown. And it's, you know, people will be like, oh, yeah, it's very similar what happens to the LGBT community with racism. And I said, yes and no. You know, there's some parallels there in terms of access or, you know, bigotry or whatever you want to call it. But I wear my color on my skin and I can't hide that. So I, could, I, I couldn't have been 10 years old and told people I was white because I'm not. You could just look at me. Whereas sexual identity is something that is is inside of you. It's something that is a part of who you are on the inside that you can choose to hide forever if you really want to, you know, to whatever the benefit that is. I don't know. But, you know, so for you to choose, okay, I'm going to just be myself and be the real me that I've always known is inside of me and just go out there and live my life. But you still had that like 10 to 15 percent being like, no, maybe not. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, it 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 was it, it was a big big decision, you know, um, to actually, you know, especially with the sort of coming out at work. But you know, I kind of had, you know, through through the allies that I had, you know, who I started talking to, you know, we kind of made sure there was there was huge amounts of support, um, you know. And uh, although you know, kind of when the day it all happened, you know, I, I was a bit of a disaster personally. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the relief afterwards was mm -hmm. you know just kind of amazing you know it was no longer having to carry all that around with me and it's mm. you know it's no longer a secret it's you know people know you know know all of me now and it's yeah. also kind of a lot for you know it made me be able to work better and do you know because I didn't have to worry about all this other stuff you know and yeah all this like other, I mean that's other, just a weight you're carrying around yeah, yeah. It, it it was. And you don't realize how big until it's gone. You know, it it was a lot of weight, you know, and like kind of, you know, as I mentioned, every decision I was sort of making, you know, uh, up to that point in my personal life, you know, then brought a lot of concern and worry for my professional life, you know, so it wasn't sort of like anything was getting easier, you know, in some ways it was getting more difficult. And like I said, you know, kind of, you know, as as I was moving more towards my ch sort of chosen gender, um, it was getting more and more difficult, you know, to hide that, you know. Mm -hmm. So I was sort of like convinced I was going to go into work, you know, and people would notice, people would see things, you know. And yeah. so like I say, it kind of, you know, it, it really had reached a crunch point, you know, kind of, you know, mentally and sort of kind of physically where something had to give. I mean, and again, once I, once I had come out, it was kind of a relief for a lot of other people because they thought I was, you know, they thought I was something ill with was something up. else. Yeah, they, they knew something was up, but they didn't they didn't know yeah. what and they didn't want to ask. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, a lot of them was like, oh, you know, we thought you were really, really ill or something. You know, it's like, you know, it's, you know, so it, it was kind of good for everyone, I think, in the end. And like I said, uh, you know, being able to sort of kind of go into work, being the re real me, you know, kind of dressing how I want to dress, you know, um, presenting as I want to present is amazing. You know, it was I'm not saying it was easy, you know, um, and the way I approached it, you know, kind of, um, you know, I, even though I sort of kind of changed gently, you know, mm -hmm. um, about my appearance, you know, and what I was wearing and what I wasn't wearing. So because, you know, it's, it, it's a big change for me to be able to do that but it was also a big change for everyone else so we you know we all had to kind of get get used to it together in some ways as well so kind of be respectful to to the you know the your surroundings as well you know i think so yeah i mean you know it's as i said you know kind of my look even in work was a little bit more androgynous it was still fairly kind of um more towards male but it was definitely more androgynous so um I didn't want to like, you know, kind of go in the next day and like, you know, kind of high heels and a dress and stuff because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not sure I would have felt comfortable doing that. And I'm not sure how everyone else would have taken that. I mean, they might, you know, mm -hmm. they might have been fully respectful on the outside, but I just felt that it's just too much of a shock for me and everyone else, yeah. you know, so I kind of, you know, sort of kind of eased into, you know, um, presenting as female a little bit, you know, sort of gently and you know over the sort of like next couple of months you know to, to where i am now so in your position now you know you are uh, a leader in the company someone who's been there 22 years um you know you're openly trans and 
you have hopefully now gotten to the point which all humans get to hopefully at some point where it's like fuck it i want to just be happy and you know like the you just get to that point where you're just like had enough with everyone else's bs and you just want to do what you want to do because you know you're good at your job you know you're good and you know you care about people and that's all that should matter right yeah how or do you see yourself as a mentor or an ally or a person of significance for anyone that's looking to enter into the hypertherm family do you do you want to be a person of of mentorship in in your role with your experiences or or are you not quite comfortable with that no i'm comfortable with that i mean since um since i come out we started up an lgbtq resource group employee resource group at the at the company you know, um, oh, that's awesome. where, where, that where, we, where we where we have mem- you know we have members right you know from our European organisation um, here in New Hampshire and also across in you know um, Minnesota and Washington, so it's all mm-hmm. kind of spread right across the company. And uh, yeah, if I can help anyone, you know who who is trans or you know from the LGBT community, and I can you know. Um, help them out or kind of put them in touch with someone else in the company where they can share experiences or they can join our group. I want to do that. I mean, mainly because mm-hmm. I don't want anyone to have to feel how I did, you yeah. know, um, seeing how accepting everyone at Hypertherm has been and how much support, you know, I've had. I don't want sort of to think that there's someone else sitting there scared shitless, worrying about what's going to happen if they come out or if someone sees them or someone finds out something that's not the way to live a life and that's not no. the way they should be. So, um, yeah, you know, kind of seems weird me mentoring people on this, but yeah, if I can help <laughs> anyone else through that situation, then I, I would gladly do it. Yeah. And it, you know, the kind of, you know, it has arisen, you know, that we, you know, that I've been mm-hmm. able to do that. So, um, you know, and it, and it, and it's good, you know, it feels good, you know, um, good. like I said, our, you know, our resource group, you know, we kind of get together, you know, once a month, you know, some, sometimes we have a lot of things to discuss. Sometimes we just, you know, kind of shooting the shit on stuff, you know, but mm-hmm. um, you get, you know, you get any group from, you know, our community together, it's always going to be fun. That's for sure. <laughs> well, I know, know. I, I attend as many as, uh, as I can, because I, I really enjoy that community. I find it to be a fantastic community for just the openness and the honesty yeah. and, and, uh, and, and the desire to just have a brighter, better world in general, yeah. which I can get behind. And I think anyone can get behind really at the, at any level. It's like, you know, it's, it's kind of a no brainer. <laughs> yeah. You know, and again, you know, through our experiences, you know, and you know, what, what we see, what we do, you know, we, we sort of try and, you know, not only help others, but, you know, kind of help the company to be you know, mm-hmm. more inclusive and diverse, you know, um, because, you know, we all have something to offer, you know, we're all, you know, um, just because you're one from one type of community or one background or, you know, whatever, doesn't mean you can't be good at your job, doesn't mean you don't have things to offer, you mm-hmm. know, um, or different perceptions on things or bad ideas. So, you know, it it's all kind of, I think it's good, you know, it's good for us as individuals, it's good for us as a group, and it's good for us as a company. And that's going to be my, my last couple of questions here to wrap up the podcast. Cause we're already past an hour. That hour just flew by. That was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. We're done. Well, yeah, we're, we're in overtime now, but I wanted to ask you in your professional opinion now, what would be some of the important first steps that a company should look at in terms of trying to be more inclusive or be a safer space for their employees in terms of the LGBT trans community you know um this is something a company struggle with everyone wants to help everyone wants to be dei progressive you know and that's very easy to say that as a as a company anywhere in the world but what you know from your opinion who's someone who's walked through it and is part of a company that feels it supports them well what would be like a good first step or first couple steps i think uh I think recognizing, you know, the, you know, the LGBT, you know, Q community is, is quite a large community, you know, and recognizing that there is a percentage of people from that com- that community already existing within the company, yeah. you know, um, and, you know, how, 
understanding how they can make you know for them to be open about themselves you know and feel comfortable about you know being open about themselves you know it could you know it's you don't maybe see it so often now but you know kind of once upon a time you used to walk through an office and you see you know you know husbands or wives with pictures of their husbands and wives i mean how often do you see you know um you know kind of a, a male with a picture of his husband or you know kind of mm-hmm. you know female with a picture of their wife and stuff like that. little things like that you still don't kind of really see but yeah. like i say yeah kind of accepting that there's people from that you know from from the community within the company and they have you know something to offer you know um there can't be many places out there that don't have someone from the community working for them. Yeah, I would say you like know, none, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and you know, is that a, you know, are those people being reached? You know, because you know, it's you know, as a company with a product to sell, you want to be able to reach everybody. Everybody, yeah. You know, and you know, you need to appeal to everyone. So you know, if you're cutting yourself off or you know kind of appear closed then you never know who you're talking to or what you're presenting as a company or you know Mm -hmm. um what they're expecting you know so i i I think so some of the first steps is you know kind of you know accepting the facts you know that that's you know those those people exist within your company and and how how would you create that safe space for them Mm -hmm. you know how you know how how can you make it so they can you know be themselves and you know come to work feel safe you know feel wanted you know not feel kind of you know victimized or you know kind of people are looking at them or you know that they still have a lot to offer they're still valued people just because of whatever else might be happening you know um sounds easy but big steps i feel (laughs) well they are and you you know i'll give you an example of years ago well not that long ago a couple years ago i was uh working at a forum for educators. I used to teach at a college before I had this job. And and I was talking to these welding educators and we were talking about uh, diversity and inclusion. I was talking about the LGBT community and trying to figure out how to become a safer space for welding students. Well, welding is one of the worst for not even LGBT. Let's even just talk about women, like as simple as women. We're at 4% in Canada, 4% of the of the welders are women, which is an atrocious number, you know? and. And if you look at demographics, statistically, women are 51% of the population, 52, depending on the year. So we actually have more women in the world than men, yet we're only 4% are welders. Okay, so that number's terrible. They, Depending on the study, the LGBTQ community could be up to 20% of the population, depending on, on where you are. And I'm, I'm happy with that number, sure, 20%. Let's use that as a, as a, as a stock number. If 4% represents 51%, what does 20% represent? That means that that's a 0.05% of, of the community is, is working in the welding industry. But the reality is that it, that number is probably significantly higher yeah. because you just don't know, right? And so I said to these instructors, I said, you know, who here in this room has had, you know, students that were openly gay or lesbian or a part of the community in your classes? And like no one's hands came up. And so I asked this one fella who actually I'd known for a number of years, a great guy. And I said, you know, you've been teaching the program for, you know, almost 20 years. Yep. How many uh, people in the community have you had in your classes? Like, I don't think I've ever had one. I said, see, what you're telling me right now, if you just rephrase what you're saying, is that you've never had anyone feel safe enough to admit that that's what they are in your class. Because in 30 years of teaching, I guarantee you there's been hundreds, hundreds of students from the community go through your course and not one of them felt safe enough in that environment to be themselves and that really kind of shook this group of teachers being like because teachers love students teachers love their students and they want all their students to feel safe and and have a great experience that's part of being a teacher and when you kind of stop and think that you may not have helped hundreds of your students be comfortable it's really shaking and and I think I wish I could get that message to employers and say, you know, stop thinking about like, how can we bring in people from this community? Like, quote unquote, let's increase our numbers of the the LGBT community. How's about let's just start accepting just to your point that they're here already. Yep. Let's just accept that they're already around us right now and they haven't come out to you or to anyone because we don't have a safe enough experience. And if we don't have that to start, 
then how are we going to bring anyone in? Because we want these people and our, our fellow co-workers to feel safe. And then they become our advocates just by the nature of them being here. Right. Yep, exactly. I mean, yeah, that's, that's why, you know, it's, it, it needs to be a, a good environment in the first place, you know, and, uh, you know, and like you say, you're, you're, the teachers, you know, 30 years, no one's felt safe enough. I mean, that's, it's kind of sad in some ways. It is. It's very you know, sad. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and that's sort of one of the things that leads me, you know, if I can help anyone, if I can support anyone, I will, you know, and it's, mm-hmm. um, you know, like I said, I spend some of my time over here in New Hampshire and some of my time in Minnesota, but, you know, I kind of, I like to go into the offices you know, um, not only is it sort of beneficial to meet up with colleagues and, you know, discuss things, but I also think it's, you know, it's important for people to see me as well. To see you, yeah. You know, and, and you know, and, you know, hopefully get some, you know, well, if she can do it, you know, mm-hmm. then it, there's, there's hope for us as yet, you know, and, and realize, you know, that the company is, you know, is, is a safe place. That, you know, they can be free to come out because I'm, you know, even now, I'm sure there's people within in the company that, you know, have a, ha, don't feel that quite yet. Mm-hmm. So, and, but, and it's the nature of the beast, and like, you yeah. never know what's happening in people's families, or you know, all the other angles that happen exactly. in, in in these decisions. And it's a tragedy to not let people just love for the sake of loving, right? That's yeah. that's all it needs to to be at the end of the day. And who's who's to judge? You know, none of us have that ability, at, you know, really. Um, is there any, I guess, to wrap it up, is there anything you'd like to say to the community listening, um, this podcast? Cause we're gonna, we're, we're actually devoting the entire month of June, which is pride month in most countries, um, to, to the LGBT community through our association. We're organizing, you know, supporting the parades across Canada. We're trying to do all these cool things and initiatives. And, and I want to interview as many people from the community to release during the month of June. Um, and so like they're, we're going to have a captive audience, I think. So if, is there anything you'd like to say to, to the people listening that might be part of the community that are in the steel trades and perhaps are thinking about getting into steel trades and are a little bit scared? I think trust in the people around you. You've got friends around you now who maybe don't know, you know, um, about you. You're not going to change just because you come out and there's, there's, they'll still like you. They'll still be your friends. Yes, there's always not one person here, but in you know in the main in the mainstream of everything i think people are a lot more supporting and you don't know the support you've got around you and until you kind of take that step and be brave um i waited too long you know Mm -hmm. looking back i should have done this way way sooner really um and i'd hate to think there's anyone out there whatever age they are you know whatever position they're in you know that they're too fearful to come out you know there's people around you who who will support you you know and they're still going to be there afterwards you know um the sun's still going to come up tomorrow the world's still going to turn you know um since i've come out i've become sort of a lot more involved in the community um you know there's a pride parade over here in um new hampshire up where we are white river um junction become involved in that you know um to help support um it, it's opened up a whole a whole new world and a whole new bunch of people acquaintances friends um for me you know which i wish i'd done so long ago mm-hmm. well, that's wait. fantastic and yeah that's great advice don't wait um your your own well-being is the first thing you should be concerned about yep. and and trying to make yourself allow yourself to be happy just you know allowing that the permission to to be happy and and there's groups out there you know our association we're a not-for-profit and if you want to reach out to us we will direct you to help and that's part of us supporting our network of tradespeople across canada and north america and something that i bring to this company that i very very focused on is trying to make our association be uh, an association which is supposed to support you whoever you are and however you are that's that's the whole point of an association and not just to handpick the the few mighty and neat and and wonderful and, and so that we're, we're we're doing our best and and thank you so much putty for coming on and being a part of this and you have a fantastic story and i hope i get to see you're going to be a fab tech in atlanta um hopefully i'd like to think i've been there i've been to quite a few of them in the past so yeah. uh, i'd like to think i'm going to be there this year too 
Son. Okay, well, I'll probably be down there too. You'll probably see me in the podcast rolling around. So hopefully, get to meet you in person up there. Okay, that's great. Thanks for your time, Max, and thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you very much. And for all the listeners, thank you for being a part of this. And please share these podcasts with your friends, especially these ones that have you know special significance to anybody that you think could could use a little bit of support. And uh, as always, you can find us on the website at the association cwbassociation.org. And uh, you guys all take care, and we'll hear, see you in the next episode. We hope you enjoy the show.